Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us tonight. Uh, we ask that you be with the speakers and give them boldness and courage uh, and the words to speak. Uh, just give them a, a clarity of mind and an organization uh, that they can uh, faithfully speak the message that you put on their hearts. We just ask you to be with us and open our ears so that we can listen to the words that you would have for us to hear this evening. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Is it recording now? Okay, sorry. Okay, guys. So, um, I'd like to start out tonight with a question that I want you to think about throughout the rest of the, uh, the time that I'm speaking. And the question is, how do we choose to identify ourselves? Just think about it. How do we choose to identify ourselves? What kind of identity do we label, our, our, label ourselves with? Most of us identify ourselves by a name, a uh, place of origin, a race, but that's not necessarily how we should do it, that's how we do do it. So how should we identify ourselves? Most of us carry a little <clears throat> card in our back pockets called a driver's license, it's usually in our wallets, and that <clears throat> card has an eye color, a hair color, generally an incorrect weight and height. Amen. Because <laughs> most of us want to be a little taller and thinner, or just thinner. But it ha also has a number on it that impersonally identifies us. Or an even more impersonal number that's in our lives is a social security number. We all have a nine-digit number that goes with us as soon as we're born, but that doesn't necessarily say who we are. It just identifies us as being alive and uh Letting us you know, buy houses and stuff like that. So if not by characteristics or by numbers, by what or rather by whom should we be identified? Maybe by being Americans. Or even uh, a little more specific, Ohioans as myself and Jacob. Georgians as most of you. Mm -hmm. uh, Rhode Islanders, whatever the heck that means. <laughs> but, but in reality, how should we identify ourselves? Maybe if it's not by what, but rather by whom. Well, how do you do that? Well, we all have a first and last name, generally. Your family has a last name. Your group of friends kind of have that kind of name click, like those people or nerds or whatever, how you want to identify yourself, or your home church. And that's how I often identify myself. I'm like, I'm from Lawrenceville. And they're like, oh, you're one of those people. No, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. But no, that's how I identify myself with my church family. So how about this? How should we identify ourselves? Well, how about by what we believe? Or the one in whom we believe? How about Jesus? How about we identify ourselves by the one who changed us and made us a new creation? Does that sound better? I think so. It's a lot better than being that heavy kid from Lawrenceville that shaved his head and occasionally sings and plays guitar and sometimes <laughs> preaches. I'd rather stick with Jesus, personally. <laughs> But let's look at why. Please open up your Bibles with me tonight to 2 Corinthians 5. And we're going to be looking at the end of the chapter. So please turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5. Once you get there, say amen. Amen. Second Corinthians 5. We're going to start in verse 17. Paul, throughout this chapter, was talking about temporal and eternal things. And also things where he takes the flesh and he pins it against the spirit. But it also has a lot of things that can be used for identification purposes. But you have to be willing to see what's there. So starting in verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So what does he mean by that? These old things have passed away within us. Well, could it be our selfish, self-centered desires that we choose to exile out of us? That the workings of Christ may be full, made full in us? Having old desires and purposes that just happen to die and pass away, that Christ may live in us as Lord, and he may be considered lords of our life? Well, I'd say yes to both, considering I wrote both down. And so, here we are. We are a new creature, a new creation. 
And that is beautiful language. Because when you're born, you're a creature. Generally, you're a creature of this world because we're all born into sin. But when Christ comes into your life, you are then considered a new creature. And therefore, you are considered a new creation. And so that could be something with which we can identify ourselves. We can then be considered a new creature, a new creation. Christ was never considered concerned <clears throat> rather, about the outside change, but rather what needed to be changed within us. He didn't really care what we wore or did. He was good friends with his cousin John the Baptist, and he wore camel fur and ate a bunch of weird stuff. But he wasn't concerned about that. He was concerned about the things of our heart. So rather, what's on the outside is what's on the inside, which is considered much more important to Christ. And he simply cannot coexist with our selfish purposes, but rather has made you new in the renewal, an exchange of thoughts in your heart and in your mind, that your mind and thoughts will be tamed by Christ himself. He has made you to be a new creation, and that is something that you can identify yourself with. Continuing in verse 18, it says this, now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So all these things that Paul was talking about, by us being a new creation, by us being a new creature, about God reconciling us through Christ in us, was all possible by the grace of God. It was the mighty hand of God, or if you're Luke, the mighty finger, that was working in Christ Jesus that reconciled us back to God. We were lost, we were alone, and we were afraid, naked and cold in the world of sin. But the warmth of the love of God in Jesus brought us back to God. That's the reconciliation, and it's all possible by the grace of God. It was only by his grace that we were brought back to him. And it's by his grace that keeps us. Now, since we have been reconciled and brought back, beckoned to the light, we now have a new ministry and purpose to also reconcile others back to God. And that's such a beautiful trans <clears throat> excuse me, such a beautiful transformation that God has performed in each and every one of us that sit in this room and as we call ourselves Christians. And we are very fortunate that He allows us to partake in His redemptive work in other people that Christ in us, we can then reconcile others back to God. And so we now have several things with which we can identify ourselves. We are a new creation, we are reconciled, and we are ministers continually reconciling people back to God. Now these are things I'd rather be identified with than having blonde hair and blue eyes. Rather, I'm a redemptive part and worker in God's grand plan. Amen. Continuing in verse 19, it says this, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he was committed to us the word of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, as was already said, not counting their trespasses. Now let's talk about that for a minute. Oftentimes, we like to dwell on what we've done wrong, and we can even identify ourselves by that sin, by that trespass, and be labeled in our societies as, as murderer, thief, maybe rapist. Sometimes we choose, and other people choose for us, to identify us, or identify us with those sins and trespasses. But what verse 19 says, the beauty of it, that God himself was not counting their trespasses against them. That he was not counting our trespasses against us. Because if he was, the redemptive work could not be made complete. Mm -hmm. Because it was God reconciling us back to himself. And he did not consider our trespasses. So if we consider our trespasses, then God Almighty, the Almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega, the Ancient of Days doesn't consider those same sins when he reconciles you back to himself, then why do we dwell on those things? Why do we dwell on those things that which we have done instead of working on the things which are to come from God? Good point. Why do we do that? Why should we dwell on the sins we have already that have already been forgiven? But if you do continually sin, I'm not saying that sin isn't bad. 
You should mourn and ask for forgiveness. But when God was in Christ bringing you back to himself, he did not identify you as a sinner, but rather a redemptive work in progress, and eventually to be a new creation. He did not count your trespasses against you when he was reconciling you back to himself. And this word of reconciliation, that's the gospel. That is the gospel of the kingdom. The beautiful words that Jesus spoke to people that led them to repentance and to change their evil hearts and to allow him to reconcile them back to his father. And that is the world of reconciliation. And that is the power that still moves us today. In verse 20, it says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. That is another identity we can have as ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors of Christ. What does that mean? Well, when a United States ambassador goes to China to talk about trading and deals and stuff like that, the ambassador represents the entirety of the government. He represents the United States. And when he goes over there and he talks, he talks on behalf of the United States, he talks for the United States, and hopefully if he's doing a good job, he's speaking the words from the United States. Well, it's the same thing when we're ambassadors for Christ. We are standing in the place of Christ. We are as Christ to whomever we're talking to. And we are also speaking and hopefully representing Christ well to the people that we are talking to. And that is awesome. We're a new creation. We're reconciled. This new creature, but we're also ambassadors for Christ. We stand in his place and we get to partake in that redemptive work of God. He makes his appeal to others through us. And that is cool. But after we are redeemed, we get to be a part of that redemptive work. But how does this redemptive work actually work like so? In verse 21, it really lays it out for us. And this is incredibly important. He made him, so he, God, made Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Oh my goodness, that is so beautiful. Let me read it again. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This redemptive work is being played out by God redeeming us through Christ on the cross. That Jesus didn't know sin, he didn't commit sin, he didn't do sin, but on our behalf became sin for all purposes so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became sin on our behalf. That way we could become the righteousness of God. And that's another new title that is granted to us. It's the righteousness of God. Now let me explain how this exactly works a little better. If you'd please flip to the next book, Galatians. It's early. <clears throat> early. It's uh, Galatians 2, verse 20. It's just probably should only be a few pages away. Galatians 2, verse 20. We're going to talk about how the righteousness of God is enacted in our lives and how this new identity should transform us. A new way to, to take these perspectives of the reconciliation that is in Christ Jesus and how it has been applied to us. In Galatians 2, verse 20, it says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave, him up, gave himself up for me. So this is how the righteousness of God works. Because it is no longer us who is living, but it is Christ who is living in us. And if it is Christ who is living in us, then it is Almighty God looking at us and seeing his Son Jesus, because it's not us who lives, but Christ who is living in us. That is how we become the righteous, righteousness of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. By dying to ourselves, by being crucified, by being shamefully put to death, 
and allowing Christ to live within us. God did incredible redemptive work in Christ Jesus and in us by allowing his son to take on our sins. He also allowed him to be crushed for our trespasses, which were not counted against us, and allowing him to live inside us and for us to become a new creature, an ambassador of Christ, for Christ, for the purposes of Christ, and to become the embodiment of Christ, the one who lives within us, that we might become the righteousness of God and put on these new identities to make an eternal difference, not only in our lives, but in those to whom we witness. So I'm going to propose something to you. We have a bit of an identity crisis. If people take our social security number and buy stuff on our name and steal our driver's license numbers and, and all that mess and lose a bunch of money and people do a lot of dumb things in our name, well, that's illegal and that's really bad. But no one can take away your identity that you have in Christ Jesus. Right. No one can forcefully take away your identity as the righteousness of God because Christ is the one who lives in you. And when God looks at you, he sees his son working inside of you. That is how we are the righteousness of God. So we have an identity crisis. It's not the color of your skin or the color of your hair or the color of your eyes or any of that that makes the difference and who we are. Rather, it's how Christ is living in you, and how Christ is working in you, and how God sees you. And that is how we are to see one another. So, if we solve this identity crisis, and choose not to identify ourselves with the things of the world, and the things that are seen, and we choose to identify ourselves with the things that aren't seen, such as the redemptive work of Christ in our lives, and Christ living inside us, how does this make a difference for us? How does this matter? Because if more people understood what we meant to God on the day that Jesus died, and how God ultimately sees us with Christ living in our lives, then we would treat each other and ourselves differently. When we continually charge ourselves with the sins that we've already committed and been forgiven for, we are weighing ourselves down. We are allowing them to reanimate them. Uh, themselves in our life. So this redemptive work and how we see each other and how ultimately God sees us will cause us to treat others and treat ourselves differently. So the first point I'd like to make from this is we should have a different understanding of our true identity, not just by our social security number or our place of origin or our race or whatever. And not being the things that are seen, but rather the things that aren't seen. And that's especially Christ living inside of us. So we need to have a different perspective on how we are to identify ourselves and to identify one another. And the point that really reemphasizes this is this. You should treat others, not necessarily how you want to be treated, although it's good, this is what Jesus says, but rather how you would treat Jesus if he was the one that was in front of you. Because that's what God sees, and that's how God has treated us. Because when we, when we interact with one another, although we cannot see the face of Jesus, it is Christ who is living inside us if we have died to our sins. So it's not necessarily how I'm going to treat each and every one of you, but in reality how I'm treating Jesus. Because you are no longer your own. You are bought with a price. And a famous quote that I once heard in a sermon, and I don't know who said it or when, I'm just letting you know that I didn't say it. Nothing's new under the sun, except, except that. I, I just made that up. No, but in reality, and I even got that joke from Seth Ross. But no, a famous, <laughs> quote, a famous quote that I don't know who it came from goes like this. God treated Jesus like Barnabas so that Barnabas could be treated like Jesus. And the same is true for us. We are bought with a price, and, and, and Christ died for us. And, and Christ had to treat Barnabas like Jesus, and Jesus be treated like Barnabas, so it, 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 you know, it equals out. Jesus took a punishment 
that he should have received, and Barnabas was released. And that is how it works in each and every one of us. So don't treat somebody necessarily how you want to be treated, especially if your life is weighing down with sin and you think lowly of yourself. But rather, how you would treat somebody else is if it, if it was Jesus in front of your face. And three, we have a lot of redemptive work to still do because we are an ambassador for Christ and we have the word of reconciliation, which is the gospel. So remember that people are changed by that word of reconciliation. And Christ is and has been actively reconciling the world back to the Father. And he is the one that lives inside you. It's not that you live inside him, but it's rather Christ lives inside you. So do that redemptive work and continually begin to, to speak the words of reconciliation to other people that the world might turn back to God. Do the redemptive work and partake in the work that you have been commanded to do. And help reform people's identities and partake in the renewal of them as people and new creatures in Christ Jesus. Remember, it's not what you've done that identifies you, but rather you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are an ambassador for Christ, Amen. and you are the embodiment of Christ. Amen. And good. when God looks at you, he sees his son. Amen. Yes, and it is you who is doing the redemptive work in the world, in place for Christ, in place for God. Thank you.